Hello, everybody, and welcome again to ChessLecture.com. This is International Master David Vigorito, and today we're going to continue looking at the King's Indian Defense for Black. Um, last time we looked at the classical variation, and this time we are going to be looking at the Samish variation, which is uh, still a very popular line. So we're going to start with D4, Knight F6, C4, G6, Knight C3, Bishop G7, E4, D6, F3, the same inch variation, castles, Bishop E3. Now, there's a few different lines here for black. Um, C5 is kind of uh, the reason that you don't see the Samish so much at a high level anymore, which Gambit's a pawn. Um, this Bononi structure is considered to be fine for black. This is actually also what we would play uh, against Bishop G5. Now, C5 can be played very easily, and, and black gets a, a very decent Bononi here playing like this. Um, so against bishop e3, like theoretically, c5 is kind of the uh, the challenging move here. Uh, this is not the line I'm going to recommend, just I think it takes a lot of study, and I think a lot of uh, club players aren't going to be so comfortable when white takes the pawn with dc, dc, queen d8, rook d8, bishop c5. Um, if anyone plays this with white, they'd probably be pretty well prepared and have something in mind. And theoretically, this is probably okay for black, but if white knows what he's doing, it's very difficult to try to win with black. So the line I'm going to look at, which is almost forgotten now, it seems, is e5, which is the old classical line. Other options include knight c6, the pano. Um, there's some kind of funny little lines with like c6 and a6. And there's also an interesting line uh, that I played before with knight bd7. But we're going to play e5 because it's the most clear strategically, I think. Now, the two main lines for white are d5 and a kind of tricky move, knight g to e2, which I think is in some ways more difficult to face uh, just because it, it's more concrete. So first we're going to look at this move, knight e2. And black plays c6. And after queen d2, knight bd7, castles, and then a6. This line you have to really kind of have something in mind for black, because when white keeps the tension, um, if you take on d4, it can be easy to find yourself without counterplay if you take on d4 too quickly. So now white plays king b1 to make room for the knight to develop. And then after b5, white has a choice here. Now, the three moves we're going to look at are c5, d5, and knight c1, which is the main line. So first we're going to look at knight c1. You don't see this line too much now, just because black has a few different ways to try to get counterplay. Um, with e takes d4, bishop takes d4, and then either rook e8 or rook b8. or even b4, like one possible line here is to play b4, and then after knight a4, to play c5. Now, white can win a pawn by taking on f6 and taking on d6, but the two bishops will guarantee that black has a lot of counterplay. And if bishop f2, uh, knight e8, to protect the d-pawn, the position's kind of unclear. Uh, white can try to play h4, h5, um, which looks a bit slow. And with black, I would play like bishop b7 to c6 to try to harass this knight and either take on a4 or start pushing the a pawn. So that's one possibility. I'm also going to bring your attention to a, another kind of interesting uh, kind of waiting move, and that's the immediate rook b8. And now if white plays knight b3, like the normal way of developing, we're going to take on c4. And now we see why the rook is on b8. And after bishop c4, a5, the position is very unclear. Um, if white ever takes on e5, we'll take with a knight, hitting the bishop, followed by like bishop e6 and maybe a4. And if white doesn't take on e5, um, there's even the possibility of playing like a quick d5. 
just kind of blasting open the open the position, uh, and all of Black's pieces are ready to kind of spring into action quickly with possible rook b4, you know, knight e5, and there can be a lot of pressure on b2 because this pawn is very difficult to protect if this diagonal opens up. So if white takes on e5 right away after rook b8, then we just do knight takes e5. And because c4 is hanging, white doesn't really want to take so much on b5. If c5, we again have this trick with b4, b4 knight a4, queen a5. And then after b3, the only way to protect the knight, we play d5 and again blast open the position. And the only way white can really try to keep the position closed is by attacking this knight with bishop d4, rook e8, and by taking it, which is a major concession. Rook takes, knight d3, rook e8, and then if e5, we just go back to d7, and if f4, f6, and we manage to pry open the position. So this move, rook b8, is just one of a, a few different solutions to meet uh, this early knight c1. Now, a couple trickier tries for white. One is to play c5, which is which is very complicated, but should suit a King's Indian player. Um, the point of this is white's trying to get a position like after dc, dc, where white just has a lot of space, like knight, knight to c1 to b3, and it's actually hard to get black, for black to get counterplay. So usually we have to meet c5 with some kind of uh, immediate action, either taking on d4 or by playing b4. And again here, b4, knight a4, queen a5, b3, we can again play d5. Because this knight's been driven to a4, we actually have control over these center squares a bit, and we can just blast open the position. And you can see the black's king feels a lot safer than white's. So c5 is like a good positional idea, but it kind of fails tactically. Now, another move that um, you don't see in many books, but which was recently recommended somewhere, is to play d5 right away. And this is an interesting idea. Um, the idea is if c takes d, c takes d, uh, or I'm sorry, knight takes d, um, this diagonal remains closed, and white can target the deep on, on d6 without really making any big concessions. Because if bc, this knight can just come to c3, and this pawn will be won back easily. Um, so I think the best move here is to play knight b6, threatening knight takes c4. Now white's forced to take this knight, which is a big concession, but white is hoping to win some material. The bishop takes b6, queen takes b6, and now dc is really forced. If knight c1, we would just take on d5, and just play like bishop d7 and rook fc8 with two bishops. Now, I know this bishop doesn't look so good, but what's really important is that the, the dark squares are still weak around um, white's king and center just because he doesn't have a dark bishop. So the only consistent way for white to play is to take on c6 in order to win the d-pawn. And then after queen takes c6, cbab, queen takes d6. Now this, this line was recently recommended for white. Um, and all that was given was like queen takes d6, rook takes d6, b4, where black tries to get some compensation in the ending. But I see no reason that uh, black should trade queens here. And I think black should just play queen b7. With the idea of still playing b4 and bishop e6, and having like kind of almost like a Banco gambit against white's king, which you certainly want to keep queens on. And white isn't really going to consider taking this e-pawn, which will open up the diagonal to white's king. So d5 I don't think is so dangerous either. So um, knight e2 really is a, it's kind of an annoying move to meet. But once you know some concrete ideas on how to allow this tension to stay here, it's not really so scary. Now the main move is d5. And here there's a few different options. Um, the most solid but kind of risky is to play c5 right away, which kind of stops white from getting all this play on the queen side. But white can play like g4 and just try to play on the king side because it's harder for black to get counterplay now that black has locked up the position. Another interesting option.
option for black, which could be considered, is this queen sacrifice with knight h5. Now after queen d2, queen h4 check, g3, knight takes g3, queen f2, knight takes f1, queen takes h4, knight takes e3, uh, threatens knight c2 check, and knight takes c4, and black will get a fair amount of material, two bishops and a couple pawns for the queen. This kind of thing is fun to play in blitz, um, and it's an interesting line, but I'm not sure how sound it is. There's also another funny option for white, which I've actually played with white in tournaments, and that's to play king d1. The main point is if black continues with something like f5, bishop g5 picks off the queen. So this is kind of a committal line. Also after knight h5, if white plays bishop to d3, it's the queen sacrifice doesn't work anymore. Um, because after queen h4, g3, knight takes g3, bishop f2. Uh, in the other position, we would have had knight takes f1, which would hit the queen on d2. So I'm going to recommend a line that has been played uh, by the likes of uh, Ilya Smirin, Big King's Indian expert, and that's to play c6. Just opening the position a little bit so that white doesn't have a free hand on either side of the board. Now, there's two different lines here again, bishop d3 and queen d2. Queen d2 is going to signal that white uh, plants the castle uh, queen side. If bishop d3, we're going to take on d5. Another kind of funny line is to play b5, the idea of undermining the center. But I think after that, white plays a com a3, stopping b4. And after bc, bishop takes c4, c5. Um, I think this actually helps white, because white will be able to open the queen side very easily with b4. So instead of getting fancy with this move, we'll just play c takes d5, c takes d5, and now knight h5, continuing the main plan. And now after knight g to e2, we will play f5. And now castles is not so good, because after f4, bishop f2, knight back to f6, black can very easily get an attack with like g5 to g4 and h5 if necessary. Um, one reason the attack is so fast compared to some other lines of the King's Indian is the location of these pieces. Now normally, in like a classical King's Indian, the bishop would be on e2, and white's knight would have moved from f3 to either d2 or e1, but by having the bishop on e2, white has a lot more control over g4. Here that's not the case. So what white really has to do is take on f5 uh, right away. e takes f5 g takes f5, and then castle. Now here we don't want to play f4, because after bishop f2, um, there's a big hole on e4 that white's pieces can easily get to with the knights. And it's not so easy to attack, because there's no pawn storm, and the only way for black to try to play is on the g file. But after something like king h1 and rook g1, it's very easy to protect g2. It's white's only weakness. So black really just has to develop here, like with knight d7. And then a sneaky move by white, king h1. Now the idea of this move is to actually play this positional move. If we do something like a6, there's this trick, bishop takes f5, rook takes f5, g4, which looks kind of crazy. But not only does it win a pawn, which isn't so important after like rook f7, g takes h5, but white, again, is playing for the e4 square, like knight g3 and knight e4. And it's not so easy for black to get play. Now, the reason white has to play king h1 right away in order to threaten this is if bishop takes f5 right away, rook takes f5, g4, rook g5, just pins the g-pawn. And after bishop takes g5, queen takes g5, uh, white's position's a mess. Black has two minors for rook and pawn, and the minors are great. Um, white could also play queen d2 to threaten this too, just by covering g5. But after the sneaky move king h1, black should play knight c5, bishop c2, and now a5. Sometimes a5 is bad because it weakens the square, but here, uh, because white's bishop has retreated, it's not so dangerous. So after bishop c2, a5, a consistent move for white would be a3. And then after bishop d7, b4, ab, ab, knight a6, rook b1. I've had positions.
positions like this with white before, and it's uh, at first it seems like well the knight is so bad on a6 because you know it has nowhere to go, but I found that just hitting this b pawn is kind of annoying for white because white has to tie up either a rook or a queen to protect the pawn. So really the knight on a6 is no worse uh, than the rook on b1 as far as usefulness. So after rook b1, black can play very actively with like queen h4 which eyes the king side and also the possibility of playing knight takes b4 because it's protected by the queen. And black is pretty active here. Another idea for black, if black gets enough peace control, is to try to play e4 at some point. It doesn't work here because black doesn't have control over f4, but a thematic idea is to play e4, fe, and then f4 to sacrifice a pawn but get control of all these squares. So that's, that's definitely something to keep your eye on for white and for black. Now we're going to go back to the other plan for white, which is to try to castle long with queen d2. And again here, we're going to play c6. c takes d5, c takes d5. Knight bd7. And after g4, a6. Now, the other way of doing this is play a6 first, and then after g4, there's this idea that sometimes crops up to play h5. Now, this is kind of a funny idea to start pushing pawns near where your king is, but this, there's a couple points to it. So it's definitely an idea to keep in mind. One, if g takes h, knight takes h5, and it's very hard for white to attack because the h pawn isn't going anywhere. Black has a possibility of knight f4, I can possibly play f5. The most annoying way to meet this is with h3. Also, if g5, just knight h7. And white can't attack on the king side. There's no breaks, because f4 would open up this long diagonal. And black can start play on the queen side with like knight d7, and b5. And there's also the possibility of a break with f6 or f5. So after h3, one idea here for black is to play knight h7. This has been recommended before. The idea is that if g takes h, queen h4 check, then queen takes h5. I'm not really so sure of this idea, simply because of like queen f2, queen takes h5, which looks positionally good for black. After bishop e2, the queen's in a little trouble with f4 coming. Uh, maybe black can do something like bishop to h6. Um, it's a sharp position, but I don't know how safe it is for black. The other idea is if white ignores this and does something like castles, now really threatening g takes h5, we play h4, blocking the king side and also preparing the maneuver bishop f6 to g5 to trade off this uh, bishop, which is now kind of bad, and leave white weak on the dark squares. Now, another way to meet g4 is to simply ignore it, which is probably safer, and play knight b to d7. And now if white does h4, now we would do h5, because white cannot preserve the tension with h3. So here we're ready to take on g4 and win a pawn, or even leave it there. And if g5, again, knight h7. And uh, black's probably better already. So if white castles, then we're going to play b5. And I think uh, black has decent counterplay here. The idea is to play knight to b6 and bishop to d7, for example, king b1, uh, knight b6, and already b4 is kind of a threat because a4 is under control, and if the knight goes back to e2, we play knight c4. So with, after knight b6, black's idea is to play bishop to d7, possibly threaten b4, maybe play queen b8 and rook c8, and I think black has a full chair of chances on the uh, on the queen side. One idea for white, too, is to play knight c to e2 right away, and then after knight b6, knight g3. But even here, after bishop d7, if g5, knight e8, uh, and otherwise we're still going to play uh, play with like queen b8 and rook c8, and this knight can either hop into a4 or c4. And it's, it's very double-edged. So for this reason, these different lines with c6. Um, this is the line I would recommend against the Samish. I use 
used to play the Samish all the time uh, for white myself before switching to some other lines. And E5 is kind of uh, out of the limelight since the C5 gambit has become popular. But this line with C6 I always found annoying to meet with white because by opening the queen side a little bit, it's not as easy for white to just have a free hand on either flank. And black will generally get counterplay on either the king side or the queen side or both. So next time we will look at the uh, Fianchetto variation of the King's Indian, which is an annoying system to face, uh, having covered the classical and the Samish. And after that, we'll look at some unusual lines in a fourth lecture. So until next time, this is International Master Dave Vigorito on the King's Indian Defense for ChessLecture.com. This is Grandmaster Damien Lemos here for OnlineChessLessons.net. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you um, in my videos. Thank you.